Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Metro City Church. It is so good to see you. I'm so yes. glad that each and every one of you is here this Absolutely. morning. My name is Sarah McLean, and my family and I have been involved here at Metro for quite a while now. This is my friend, Amanda Trojan. And we did not plan this jean jacket thing. It just happened. We got the mom jean jacket. We did not call each other. It just worked today. Yes. It um, looks good. Amanda is quite involved here at the church as yeah. well. You've probably seen her back in City Kids if you head back to City Kids at all. But Amanda and I are both moms, yeah. and we are in the thick of it right now. And so today on Mother's Day, we wanted to take this opportunity mm -hmm. to talk about motherhood. And not just motherhood, we want to talk about womanhood. Mm -hmm. Because it is not easy, ladies, to live as a mom or as a woman in this world today, right? No. With the right. demands, with the pressures, it's not easy. And so we want to talk about it. And our hope and our goal is that as you leave here today after our time together, that you will be encouraged yes. and that you will be lifted up. Yes. And you know, I don't think that this is just for women or mothers. I think that men, if you're in here and you have ever been stressed out about a woman in your life and a mom, you're going to get something from this too because you're going to understand a little bit more of just some of the struggles and pressures that we do go through. And then that will allow you to support her and love her just a little bit more. So no matter who you are and what you are right here, we know you're you're going to walk out encouraged. Yes. Yeah. Um, as I said, Amanda and I are both moms. We are in the trenches. And it is sometimes crazy town. Anyone? Um, I saw a video online recently that was like this mom who had like seven bags over her shoulders. She had like three water bottles. She had her laptop she was balancing. She was on a cell phone call. She had a couple of kids hanging on her leg. And it was like, this is me trying to drink enough water, excel in my career, keep the laundry done, um, eat enough vegetables, text everyone back, be a good mom and wife, and survive, right? If anybody is getting their laundry done, can you please come to my house and help a sister out because it's just not happening. But you're right, Sarah, and I think that video actually was me because just this morning trying to get here for church, I had to be here at 8.30. I'm walking out with bags and balancing lunch and yep. on my feet. I got a kid crying because they don't want me to leave. I got the other one screaming, Mom, you forgot to do my hair. And I'm like, Dad's got to do it. Sorry, honey, what you look like. But it's true. We just, it, we're just trying to balance it all, right? It's Yes. It's the realities of life. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I know that we might be chuckling right now, and you might be kind of nodding your head in agreement, but at the same time, I think there's a real possibility that some of us are also just kind of blinking away a couple of tears that kind of form. Yeah. Because this is real for us, and this is heavy to be a mom and to be a wife and to figure out how do I balance it all? There's so many demands, so many pressures, so many different things to get right all at the same time. Because sometimes I can get the workout right on one day, but at that same day, I'm blowing it at dinner or at screen time or whatever it is. But how do we get this right? And I think that that's a question that we all ask. Yeah. How can I get this right? And even more so, how can I follow Jesus faithfully? Yeah. In this culture, in this world today, how can I follow Jesus faithfully? What's the secret? And so, Amanda, I know that you've been developing a framework for women yeah. and for moms to flourish in their faith. So yeah. I wonder if you would tell us about that this morning. I would love to. You guys ready to hear about this framework? Yeah. All right. So uh, this framework is actually something that God, he actually kind of brought it up to light in my own life and my own journey as a mother. Um, being a mom, as I'm sure many of you know, it can bring up things in your life. Just things that I was thinking, things that I was feeling. And for many of us, you may be parenting children and reparenting yourself at the same time. And it can be very challenging. And so I noticed that what I was thinking was making me feel certain ways. And it affected my life, not just as a mom, but it affected every area. And it's true that our thoughts and our beliefs about ourselves and about the world around us, they actually shape the reality that we live in. 
And so this was a typical day for me. I got up early to get my Bible time in. I was doing my journaling, you know, just trying to get my quiet time with God because once kids are up, it doesn't happen. Amen, ladies, you know. It's crazy. Try to get a workout in before the kids get up, and then the kids wake up. And then as soon as the kids wake up, it's bam, it's game time. You got to get them fed. They're hungry. They're, I'm thirsty. I got to go to the bathroom. They're fighting. They're crying over what kind of cups you put their orange juice in. And you're like, it's 7 in the morning. How do you have all these strong feelings? <laughs> then you're like, okay, let's stop the fighting. Let's get you some lunch. Let's go down and have a nap. Well, I work, so I want to make sure I get some work time in while it's nap time. Then I do my city kids tasks. Then after that, got to make dinner, got to make sure everything's done, got to make sure the house is clean again because the toddlers just destroyed the whole room that I was playing in, so I just gave up. Then hubby comes home, and I got to make sure I spend some time with him. So at the end of the day, I literally crawled into bed, my body exhausted, but my mind going a million miles a minute. And you may relate to this, when you hear the thoughts that I was thinking, thoughts like, I didn't get that project done. I'm gonna be behind. Did I yell at the kids too much today? Mm -hmm. Did I spend enough time with them? Did I spend enough time with God? Did I spend enough time with my husband? Did I eat today? Did I drink any water? Did I go to the bathroom alone? It's just these things that happen all the time. And then I'm a failure. I feel like I'm a failure. I should have done better. And immediately, once that thought pops up into my head, I get this wave of guilt and shame that washes over me. And now there's more thoughts that come in. So-and-so on Instagram, she just made this incredible sourdough bread. Meanwhile, my kids are eating chicken nuggets for the fifth day this week. Or so-and-so, boy, she sure has her life together. And I'm over here looking like a hot mess. I must not be a good mom. And these thoughts begin to run through my mind on repeat. Anybody know Miss Rachel, that really peppy song? I'm so happy. Well, that's how my negative thoughts were literally running through my head. Anybody willing to admit that they felt this way sometimes? Yeah. And you know what? We're not the only ones. You know, you can go on social media and you can see posts from other women who are feeling the exact same way, who just feel like, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I have what it takes in this motherhood game. As a matter of fact, the statistics are confirming what so many of us moms are currently experiencing and feeling. I recently attended a kids ministry conference in Tennessee, and one of the breakout sessions there was on the state of motherhood in the church. And I was intrigued by this because A, I'm a mom, and B, I'm a mindset coach that works with other moms. And I really wanted to say, you know, what are other moms thinking and feeling, and am I the only one who feels this way? And you might not be surprised to hear that moms Christian moms and non-Christian moms alike, they experience a wide range of emotions when it comes to motherhood. And here's just some of the statistics from this recent research. When asked how moms view their life and their circumstances, only 48% feel like someone cares for them. 44% feel anxious about making important decisions. 44% feel overwhelmed with responsibilities. 33% report being afraid to fail. 36% of women polled actually feel confident in themselves. 25% feel lonely and isolated from others. And 13% of these women said that they feel bitter and resentful. And what's even more astounding is that 82% of women believe that motherhood is harder than ever today. And I think we all know that that's true. And 69% of moms agreed with the statement in some way that I struggle to feel like I'm enough as a mom. Mm -hmm. And if that's you, I want you to, to know that I see you, that Sarah and I see you, but most importantly, that God sees you. Amen. And I truly believe that God wants you to feel fully understand your true worth and where it comes from mm -hmm. so that you can flourish in every area of your life.
And gentlemen, I think this is probably true for you guys as well. You look around at the competition and you're like, do I measure up? Do I have what it takes in this world to actually flourish? Well, let's look at what the word flourish means. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as of a person, animal, or other living organism to grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way, especially as the result of a particularly favorable environment. Our God, he loves growth. Like if we look in Colossians chapter two, the verse says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. And I don't want us to miss that. That when we have strong roots in him, our faith grows strong in truth. Anyone in here ever plant a garden? Okay. So then you know that in order for healthy plants to grow, the first thing that you have to do is you have to uproot the weeds that are in the soil. And this is actually the first part of the framework, to dig and to literally pull out weeds of not enoughness, of comparison, of shame, of guilt. You pull them right out of our minds. You know, weeds are invasive and they choke out the growth of that tiny seed. And the weeds that we have growing in our minds will choke out God's truth about who he is and about who we are in him. So let's take a look at the parable of the four soils. Jesus would often teach in parables. These were short stories that used familiar concepts to the people who were listening to explain a deeper, more spiritual truth. And in this parable, Jesus talks about four different types of soil that a farmer planted. Now, in Jesus' time, there wasn't fancy machines that planted your seeds in a nice straight row. Farmers would often go into the field with large sacks of seeds on their back, and they would throw literal handfuls of seeds into the field. Now, the goal was to get as much of the seed into the good soil as possible because the farmer knew, hey, the wind's going to blow some of these seeds away, the birds are going to come take them, or some of the seeds just might not fall on good soil. Luke talks about this parable in gospel, I'm sorry, in chapter 8 of his gospel. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Our minds are like the soil, and the seeds are God's word. And the soil makes a difference, so getting the weeds out of the soil of our mind is the first and most crucial step in actually flourishing in our lives. But if you pull out the weeds and don't replace it with something good, those weeds will grow back and they'll grow back even more. Which is why the second part of this framework is plant seeds of God's truth. Really getting deep into our hearts what God says about us. And we do that by getting into his word. The Bible has such beautiful insights into who God is, who he created us to be, and who we are in him. Mm -hmm. And I know personally for myself that when those lies come, because they still do come, Sarah and I, we have not arrived. We still battle these lies every day. But now when they come, we can replace those lies with God's truth. So when that lie creeps up, I'm a failure, I can replace it with, no, I'm not. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm a child of God. I'm not a failure. But in order to plant seeds of God's truth, we have to be actively engaged in seeking him by reading our Bibles and by spending time with him. Because what we focus on expands. And when we focus on God and who he is and who we are in the light of Jesus, we begin to develop our spiritual muscles and grow in our Godfidence. 
So now that we've uprooted these weeds of lies and negative thoughts, and we've replaced them with God's truth, we come to the last part of this framework, which is called Sow the Harvest of Abundance, and Purpose, and Calling. In the parable of the four soils, Jesus further explains the good soil produces a plentiful crop. He said, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. And I believe that God looks at us the same way. When we're growing healthy minds and we're growing our souls and we're seeking him to nourish our roots so that we can be strong and live out our God-given calling and purpose here on this earth, it delights him. He created us on purpose and for a purpose. And I love that the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that we are God's workmanship. We're his handiwork, his art, and we tell his story. Friends, God wants us to flourish. He gives us the tools to do so too, but we have to be willing to say yes to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, Sarah, I know that you have been reading about someone in Scripture who actually found the secret to living faithfully for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Will you share with us about that? Yes. Can you grab this one? Yeah. Thank you. Um, man, I think if you guys are anything like me, like we want to get this thing right. We want to live faithfully for Jesus. And we want to figure out how to balance it all, all of these demands, all of these pressures. What is the secret? I think that there is someone in Scripture that has figured out the secret. She has cracked the code to how to live this life faithfully. Do you want to know who it is? It is Mary of Bethany. So will you look into Mary's story with me this morning? Are you guys in? Let's look at Mary of Bethany. And we're going to see that every time Mary of Bethany appears in Scripture, exactly three times, she has the same posture and the same position. So I want you to watch out and listen for Mary's posture and Mary's position every time she appears in Scripture. Well, the first time that we meet Mary is in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus and his disciples were visiting Mary's village of Bethany. And Mary's sister Martha actually opened up her home to Jesus to host him and um, have him come and visit. And you might remember this story of Mary and Martha where Ma Martha was distracted by all of the preparations and the cooking and all of the things that need to be done when we are hosting or having guests over. And in Luke 10, 39, it says that Martha had a sister called Mary who sat where? At the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Mary sat at Jesus' feet, listening to him instead of helping her sister. And Martha, um, I think understandably, was upset about this, and she actually confronted Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, maybe the disciples were kind of um, holding their breath and kind of looking at Martha because Martha actually said, Lord, tell her to help me. And Jesus met Martha with such patience and with such grace. What he said to Martha was, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, I'm sure that Mary knew that there were chores to be done. I'm sure that Mary knew that things needed to happen and that things needed to be done. We all know that. We all get that. And I don't think that Mary was trying to be a bad sister and, like, leave it all for Martha to do. But I think that Mary understood something. It was almost like Mary understood that there will always be things to do. Have you ever thought, man, I want to read my Bible. I want to get into this. I want to pray. I want to grow in my faith. I want to serve at church. But I just don't have time. My life is just so full. I just don't have time. 
And we legitimately do. We have busy lives and busy schedules. But this is the question I want us to ask. Will we ever really catch up? Will there ever really be a good time where we've got everything all done and everything all caught up and there's nothing else to do and we're able to get to it? Mary seemed to understand that she needed to sit at Jesus' feet. She needed to listen and learn from his word right in the middle of all of the daily responsibilities. And Jesus said that she chose what was better. So how can you and I learn from Mary? What can we take away from this? How can we choose what is better? I wish that we can invite Jesus into our home and sit at his feet in the living room and listen and learn from him. And obviously we can't do that. But can't we sit with his word and listen to the voice of God and the words of God and learn from him here? We can sit with our Bibles open and we can dig in here, listening and learning from him. The second time that Mary appears in scripture is in John chapter 11. And it is right after tragically Mary's brother Lazarus had died. And Mary was grieving, she was hurting. This was a real and a substantial loss. And if you have had a loss in your life, you understand the pain this pain that Mary was experiencing. But Mary heard that Jesus had arrived in her town again, and it says that she ran out to meet him. And in John eleven thirty two, 32, it said, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell, where? At his feet. At his feet. And said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Have you ever been there? in tragedy, in pain, in grief, with questions, asking God, why, where were you? Why is this happening? Mary knew where to take her tears and where to take her grief, and it was to Jesus' feet. She fell at Jesus' feet. And the passage goes on to describe the comfort and the compassion that Mary found there at Jesus' feet, because as Mary wept and as Jesus felt her pain, it says that Jesus was troubled in spirit and Jesus actually wept. Mm. Mary found compassion and comfort at the feet of Jesus. She brought her tears to Jesus. She fell at his feet with her grieving right in the middle of her hardships and her suffering. And the greatest comfort ever known is what she found. The third time we see Mary appear in scripture is um, in John chapter 12. And this time it is just a few days before Jesus would face the cross. Just a few days before Jesus would go to the give his life on the cross. And Jesus was at a a dinner with his friends and with Lazarus was there. And it says in the passage that Martha was serving food, as Martha does, and that Lazarus was sitting around the table with Jesus and the guys. And Mary entered the room. Mary came in right into the middle of this dinner party. It seems like Mary didn't care what was going on all around her. She didn't care who was watching. I think in this passage, Mary recognized the infinite worth of Jesus who was there in the room with her and Mary had to worship. I think Mary was so intent and had made a practice of sitting at Jesus' feet and listening and learning. And so she knew, she picked up on the fact that he was going to face the cross and it was coming soon. Some of his disciples didn't even recognize that that was about to happen, but Mary listened and she knew. And so Mary took this expensive bottle of perfume and she bowed before Jesus in humility right there at the table in the middle of the dinner party. And John 12, verse 3 says, Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it, where? At his feet. On Jesus' feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. 
Now, the text says that the others around her didn't understand Mary's devotion. They didn't get it. They didn't know why she would pour herself out and her most valuable possession probably out on Jesus' feet. And they actually criticized her. And it says that Judas said, man, that perfume was worth a year's worth of wages. We could have fed the poor with that. Why are you pouring that out on Jesus' feet? But Jesus came along and defended Mary. Jesus came along and said, leave her alone. She is doing a beautiful thing, pouring out her offering at my feet. She is preparing my body for burial. See, Mary understood that Jesus was worthy of her costly worship. And we can observe from Mary that her posture and her position was always bowing at the feet of Jesus. Always at Jesus' feet. In all of those scenarios that we read about, she always seemed to know where to go because I think that Mary knew the secret to living faithfully for Jesus. I think Mary knew the secret, and this is the secret. The secret is the source. The secret was her source. Mary always seemed to go to Jesus' feet because I think she realized that the source for all that she needed was in Jesus. That she could find all that she needed by humbling herself before him to find in him everything that she needed to glorify him. Mary was always at Jesus' feet in all of these varying situations in her life, in the middle of the daily hustle and bustle, with all the daily responsibilities, she found Mm. listening and learning from Jesus. She Mm. found her purpose. In the middle of her hardship and her real suffering, in her tears, and she found compassion and comfort. And in the middle of being criticized and misunderstood by the people around her, she worshiped at Jesus' feet Mm. anyways. She found her purpose there. Mary knew where to go, and it was to the feet of Jesus. She found what she needed there, and that was her source. Her secret was her source. Mark's gospel actually talks about this same story of Mary pouring out her costly offering um, and she, Mark uses a phrase that I want to I share with you and I want to catch because it's so good. Mark says in his account when um, Jesus is defending Mary, he says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And catch this phrase that Jesus says, she did what she could. She did what she could. See, Mary sat at Jesus' feet, the source for all that she needed, and then she did what she could. Can we do that? Can we leave here today with that plan? Saying, I don't really know how to juggle everything, but my plan is to sit at Jesus' feet because I know that that's the source of all that I need and then to do what I can. And see what God does with that plan because I think that we would see God show up so powerfully as we depend on him. And that source at Jesus' feet, in Christ Jesus, is inexhaustible. Did you know that? One of the attributes of God is his infinitude, which just means that God is infinite. And so as we go to this source, he is inexhaustible. Mm. Did you know that God never sleeps? Mm. Did you know that God never gets tired? Did you know that there is no end to God, that there's not one thing that he will ever run out of. There is no scarcity in God at this source. He has endless love. God has endless compassion. He has endless patience for us as we receive from him. There is endless forgiveness. There's endless strength. He is our source, and our source is inexhaustible. How does that help you face this week? And whatever you're walking through this week, God is our source and he is limitless. And there are always people watching. We always have the eyes of our children, of our grandchildren watching us. There are always um, our spouse, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our 
strangers that are around us, watching us and seeing us going to the source. They see us going to Jesus for all that we need, and then they see him providing for us. Do you think that at some point these observers might start to ask a question, hey, can I get some of that? Mm, mm, mm. Because I see you going to the source and mm -hmm. I see you getting what you need from the feet of Jesus. Can I join you right. there? Because if he has all that you need, maybe Jesus has all that I need too. Yes. Yes. And so mm. what if we all left here today saying, you know what? I don't know exactly how to juggle it all, to follow Jesus faithfully and navigate all of these pressures and demands swirling around me. I don't know how I'm going to eat enough vegetables. I don't know how I'm going to keep up with the laundry, Amanda. But I do know one thing. What I do know is that I have a source. Yes. Mm -hmm. And my secret is my source. Mm -hmm. I know that I find all that I need at Jesus' feet to navigate this life and to follow him faithfully no matter what you're walking through. And so how are you inspired by Mary's story this morning? How are you inspired by her example to sit at Jesus' feet listening and learning in the middle of the daily chaos? How are you inspired to fall at Jesus' feet weeping and mourning in the middle of your hardship and your suffering? And how are you inspired to worship at Jesus' feet, pouring out your costly offering to him, even when others don't get it, even when others don't understand your devotion, giving your all to him because he is worthy. See, Mary's secret was her source. And if we have this source, which we do, if you are a believer, have this source in Christ Jesus, then it doesn't matter how weak we feel. That's right. It doesn't matter how under-resourced we are or how limited we are or how impossible it all seems. Mm. Because we know the secret. Yeah. And the secret is the source. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you have provided all that we need in Christ Jesus. God, would you remind us, would you encourage us this morning that you are the source of all that we need, that you are inexhaustible, and we can come to you for all that we need to live this life faithfully and to walk out this journey of motherhood or womanhood or manhood or whatever it is. God, we pray that we would walk out of here committed to you, mm. and that as we go to you, our source, mm. that others would see that and that they would go to the source with us. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in our church and in our families and in our lives. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. So good, ladies, so good. Sarah, Amanda. Uh, I really appreciate you guys. You know, I look at their families, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great families out there. There really are. Um, but there, there are two of those right there that are doing it right. You know, when I, when I look around in our culture, maybe you've noticed this as well, but families aren't flourishing. Some are, but a whole bunch aren't. And we want to flourish, amen? Anybody with me on this? We want better families. And... Um, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to say at this church over and over and over is when, whenever you get Jesus, the source, into the middle of the mix, it gets better because better begins with, with God. Better begins with God. And friends, it is never too late to change the tra trajectory of your family. It's never too late. Um, we got to work on this. Amen. We got to do this on purpose. We got to grow our families well. Amen. Y'all with me on this? All right. So we're going to we're going to have a, uh, a time of what we call child dedication. I don't know if you've ever been to a child dedication, but it's something that we do uh, to honor families, to honor God, to thank God uh, for our families. And, and this idea of child dedication, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but it dates back to the very, very beginning of really recorded history. Uh, some of you guys may remember the story of Moses uh, in the lands of Egypt. Anybody remember that the uh, people of Israel were enslaved in the lands of Egypt? Just throw your hands up if you remember this, okay, this story. And uh, God raises up a deliverer named Moses. Help me out, named Moses. And Moses 
uh, is told by God to go to the Pharaoh, the king, and say, let my people go. And the Pharaoh was like, nah, not really. We're not going to do that. And so God sends a series of plagues. Does anybody remember this? And they were terrible, like frogs and all kinds of crazy stuff. And, 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 and the, the last plague was the most terrible of all. God had had enough of Pharaoh's hard heart. God wanted his people to be free. And so God says, you will let my people go. And if you don't, anybody remember this? It's the, the plague of, of taking the life of all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. But God says to the people of God, to the people of Israel through Moses, he says, but I will protect you. I will pass over you if you show loyalty to me. And, and, and they were told to paint the blood of a lamb on their doorpost. And this became the Passover. Have you ever heard of the Jewish Passover? Well, that's what they're celebrating is that the angel of death passed over the households of Israel because they wanted to honor God. Well, Pharaoh frees them. And you may not know this, but as soon as they leave uh, Egypt, the people of Israel, as soon as they leave Egypt, they're just kind of making their way toward the promised land through the wilderness. Did you know that right away God says, hey, 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 hold on. You're going to do something. You're going to remember who the great gift giver in your life is. And you're going to remember who it was that passed over your sons in the land. And so I don't know if you know this, but God, through Moses, speaks to the people and says, you will do a child dedication. And I want to read to you the words of the first child dedication that's ever recorded. And it's found in the book of Exodus. Uh, Moses says, uh, through, the Lord says through Moses, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, dedicate to me all the firstborn sons of Israel and every firstborn male animal. So even the puppy dogs got into this, right? And it was a symbol of saying, God, we thank you for sparing us. We thank you for our children. We thank you for the gift of life over us. Can somebody in the room say amen? amen. And then if you were to fast forward well over a thousand years later, you, you come to Jesus. Anybody in the house uh, know the name Jesus? Anybody? So you come to Jesus. Well, did you know that Jesus' earthly mother Mary and father Joseph, they brought Jesus to church just like this, and they dedicated Jesus at the temple. Did you know this? They dedicated Jesus. Like this, on the eighth day after uh, a, ma a male child was born, they would bring that son to the, to the temple and they would offer that son to God. They would recognize God's great generosity and thank God for his gift of having children. And then that's when they would make their name official. Did you know this? You could spend the first eight days and you could switch names like 10 times, but on the eighth day, you nailed down the name. Some of you guys are going, I wish we would have thought that through a little bit, you know. Uh, but, but let me read to you what, what, what it says in, in the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 2, about child dedication. It says this, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So as Christians, now, thousands of years later, we bring all of our children, boys and girls, we bring them to the Lord. And we recognize that they are a gift from God. And that's what child dedication is. What's interesting is I was kind of raised in a culture where uh, you thought of like a child dedication or a child baptism. You, you thought of that as some, some way or, or somehow ensuring your kid's salvation. That, that's not the case at all. It's not found in the Bible at all. When we dedicate children, we do what the scripture says. We literally thank God for our kids. We, we thank God for his goodness and grace over us. And we recognize that we need God's help. Amen. We're literally saying, God, I can't figure this all out on my own. We need you. As parents, we need you. Uh, parents in the house, has it, has it ever been hard? Parents in the house, has it ever been hard? Yeah. Then you need to turn to God. Then you need to turn to God. And so what we're doing today is we're going to celebrate some families all weekend long of, of uh, young families that are turning to God, recognizing that they need help from God to do it right because they want to do it right. And we want to celebrate them. So if you're having your child dedicated today, can you hustle up and make your way right up front here? And then Meredith will get you up on stage. And Metro, why don't we celebrate these families as they come? Yeah. You know, as they come, one of the great things uh, about our church, like right from the very, very beginning, uh, is we honestly, we've targeted young families. Um, you know, it's funny, like I'm 53 now and I've had some conversations with people who are older than me and, and they'll say like things like, hey, why don't we, you know, really concentrate on some of the older styled stuff? And I, and I say this, I say unashamedly, but humbly, I say, I've had church for me all my life. We want to create a church that young people connect with God. We want to pass my, I want to pass my faith on to the kids. 
right? Does anybody in the room hear what I'm saying? We want to pass it on to our kids. We don't want it to, come on, get up here, let's go. We're waiting on you. Hey, while they're coming up, uh, I want to let you know that we are starting VBS, uh, Vacation Bible School. It's big, uh, summer camp at Metro. It's incredible. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. So if you have kids and grandkids, we're actually starting pre-registration as of today. I think there's cards on your seats. Uh, take a look at those and uh, share those with friends. Take those. Don't just leave them here. Pick one up. Give it to a friend. Give it to somebody with kids because we want to pack out our VBS. Amen? All right. Hey, let's meet these families. Let's give it up for one more time to these families. All right. Let's spread this way a little bit. Spread this way a little bit. Spread this way a little bit. Come over here, guys. Over here. You guys come over here a little bit. I want to make this look good. Yeah. Come on over here. There we go. There we go. We're gonna... Okay. Here come the babies. We got some babies. Let's get these babies up here. We got more babies coming, I think. You're the only baby deliverer? Don't you guys have a baby? Where's the baby? <laughs> Meredith, where are the babies? We got more babies? Are more coming? Where's our... Let's give it up for city kids, but this is the first time we've never had babies. On, I literally told you guys we've never lost a baby. Now apparently we've lost at least three. Man, oh man. Sorry. I don't know why they're... Okay, here they come. Yay for the babies. Come on. Yay. Woo. Bring them up. Bring them up. There we go. Here they come. Here they come. Yeah. They're probably having a wrestling match or something back there. Okay, I see two. I think we are missing one. That's close enough. Is that our last one? Get them on. Get them up here. Get them up here. Get them up here. Quick, quick, quick. Don't trip, though. That'd be bad. Okay. There we go. Yeah. You guys came through. All right, thank you guys so much. This is great. All right, let's meet these families, and then, uh, and then I'm going to talk to you guys for just a moment. You guys got a card? You lost your card. Boy, oh, you lost. lost. Way to go. Blame him. That's, that's good. That's good. So what's your guys' names? Uh, Timothy. Haley. And uh, give me the kids' names. This is Paisley. Paisley. And that's Junior. Junior? Yeah. Nice. Paisley and Junior. Beautiful. And she's sleeping her way right through. <laughs> hey, we are so excited for you guys. You're doing it right. Thanks. Way to go. Way to go. All right, you guys got a card? No. What is happening with this crowd already? Man, we lost babies, we lose cards. All right, give me your names, guys. I know you. Juan. Juan. Ariel. And Ariel. And this is baby? Aria. Aria. I know you. You're my grandson's friend. Yeah, you guys hang out. How cool is that? What's that? <laughs> Good, good. Hi. Do you have a card? Yes. All right. You did it right, Juan. All right. Uh, Gabriella is the mom, and this is baby Dylan. Say hi to baby Dylan. Yeah. I am so glad that you're here. You're doing it good. You're doing it well. Way to go. And hey, we're super glad you guys are doing this, man. This is great. All right. You guys got a card for me? I hope. All right. Everybody, this is Tyler and Natalie, and say hi to Bo. Baby Bo. That's a big name. That's a big name for a little guy. Yeah, man, I'm so proud of you guys. This, this is good. Bo's like, man, I, that guy's really good looking, way better looking than my daddy. Yeah. Oh, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> everybody, this is Stephen and Carrie, right? And this is baby Callie. I said, Kaylee, Kaylee, so cute. Oh, my goodness. What are you looking at? Oh, okay, there you go. Hi. Everybody say hi to baby Callie. Awesome. Way to go, you guys. All right. Hey, everybody. This is David and Jordan. David and Jordan. And, uh, okay, help me. Wait, make sure you get this right. Rebel? Yeah. Rebel. Rebel. Is this one Rebel? <laughs> Not Rebel. 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 Okay, that's good. We wouldn't want to name our kid Rebel right from the start. <laughs> that, that comes later. Okay, and then, uh, and then this is Ari. 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 You handsome boys. Look at this. You guys got your hands full right there. There you go. We're proud of you guys, man. Way to go. Glad you're here. Okay. Hey, everybody. This is William and Alyssa. Say hi to William and Alyssa. And this is baby Luxon. Luxon. You guys are relatively new to the church, which is really cool. And five years. Oh, five years. <laughs> How come I just met you recently? Okay, we just met recently, okay? I try to meet everybody, but uh, we are so proud of you. This is great. Yeah, this is great. We're, we're so happy for you. you. Um, now, parents, I want you to, to, to listen to me just for a moment. I know you got your kids, but I want you to, to zone in on this. This is so important. I want to read to you something that Moses told the parents that he was leading thousands of years ago. And it's literally as applicable for today as it was the moment it was written back then. 
Uh, and I just want to read to you. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. And here's what it says in God's word. It says, hear, O Israel. So pause real quick. We can say, hear, O parents of Metro babies. Okay? It's the same thing. Okay? It says, hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God, the Lord is one God. Then it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's the first command for a parent. It's not for you to, to tell your kid what to do, to make sure they're fed right, to get them educated. The first command for you as parents is to love God, to love God. That is the first and the greatest command for you. And then it says this, these are the commandments I give you today and they are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up and when you go to the taco stand and when you go to the Heritage Park and when you go to Lake Michigan to the beach, when you hit Cedar Point, Talk about God. Impress them on your kids. In other words, you take your faith with you and you give it to your kids. So this really tells us two things. Listen, it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Parents, look at me real quick. Look at me real quick. You cannot give to your family what you do not have. You do not give to your kid something that's fake in you. You pass on you to your kids. So the command for you is to love God with everything that you have. Listen, our kids will see through our hypocrisy. Amen? Amen. You see through it. I see through it. We are to love God. Parents in the room here, it is never too late to make sure that the greatest love in your life is God. You love him with everything that you have because that's going to flow out of you into your children, out of you into your family. So parents, your first job, the greatest command is for you to love God. You cannot expect your children to love God if you don't love God. And then the second thing it says, to pass the baton, to impress this on your children. It's not by accident. It doesn't happen by just luck. You have to lead your family. It is your job. The government does not raise your children, right? The schools do not raise your children. The nanny doesn't raise your children, the babysitter doesn't raise, they'll help but you are the father and you are the mother. It is your job. It is your job to make sure that you have the values that you want passed on to your kids. You have to decide that, amen? Parents, you hear me on this? And so we're gonna, we're gonna uh, make a commitment today, much like a wedding, where there's a, a, a commitment and at the appropriate moment, you're gonna say, we do. And, and because what you're doing today is you're publicly thanking God for your children and you are publicly saying, God, I need your grace in my life. I need your leadership in my life. I need your help in my life. I need your spirit in my home. I need more of you in my life, in my home, with my kids. Amen? So parents, let's make this commitment. Here is the first commitment. The command of God is clear and simple. Love God and teach your kids to do the same. So parents, by coming forward today, you hereby recognize that your child is a gift from God and you thank God for his gift to you. And today you are dedicating yourself and your children to the Lord. If so, please say, we do. We do. It is your job to point your kids to the Lord. Here's the second commitment. Having come freely, I now ask that you enter into the following commitment so that your children may come to know abundant, the abundant life found in a personal relationship with Jesus. Do you vow to create a home where God is loved and where the principles and values found in his word are honored? If so, please say, I do. Friends, listen to me. Uh, it is a scary thing to be responsible for the for the nurturing of the soul of your children. I remember when I was a young dad, uh, we had four little kids running around. It was always crazy and chaotic. Uh, but somehow, in, in our little home, we had to manage sitting down as a family, day in and day out. I mean, it was a daily thing in our life. We had to figure out how to open God's word and get the right little children's Bible to help them and get it age appropriate. But, but daily, listen to me, mom and dads, listen to me. I'm not kidding. It's a daily thing because somebody's going to raise your kids. It's going to be the world or it's going to be you. It's going to be the world or it's going to be you. I'm thinking that you should probably take that job on, right? You, you should probably take that job on. And so, like in my little home, even it annoyed my kids like crazy, uh, we did devotions as a family every day. The very best we could or as much as we could, we, we would try. And we prayed together 
all the time, like every meal. We would pray together. Like, didn't we just pray for lunch? Yeah, we're going to pray for dinner now, too. We're going we're to thank God. We're going to invite God into our home. Every night when we went to bed, we would try to pray with our kids. We wouldn't always get it right, but we made it a priority. Because why? We wanted to raise our kids the way we wanted them raised. And I'm just telling you that you have a job to do that. Amen? Now, church, uh, the government uh, isn't raising these kids. These guys are. And uh, the schools aren't raising the kids. These guys are. Uh, you're not raising these kids. These guys are. You know, there's an old saying, it takes a village. The village doesn't raise a kid, but the village helps create an atmosphere where kids can be raised well. Amen? And, and this is... This is the village that we have, that, that we come to for, for friendship, for encouragement, and, and for spiritual growth in our homes. And so you have a job in this, and I'm going to ask that you would stand to your feet and that you would make a commitment alongside me to help create the right kind of church where these kids and these families can flourish. All right? So you ready for this? When I read this commitment, if you're serious about building this kind of church, then, then you will say, we do, at the appropriate time. All right, so here we go. You say ready? Ready. Say ready. Ready. So that these children may come to know the abundant life found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, do you vow, church members, to faithfully love and encourage these families to become fully devoted followers of Jesus? Do you vow to model and to teach these children what it means to follow Jesus? Do you commit to create a church where... Those where these children can see what it means to trust Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, forgiver, and friend. If so, please say, we do. We do. We want to create a great church. And it's going to take a bunch of ordinary people to do something great. We're going to have to give. We're going to have to pray. We're going to have to serve. We're going to have to sacrifice. Because these families are worth it. Somebody did it for your family. We should do it for somebody else's family. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, I love you guys, and uh, we're going to pray for these kids. Uh, we're going to bless this, these families, and you guys are going to pray with me. So can I have a baby who won't scream at me? Oh, this guy, he's easy going. Up. Okay, we're going we're gonna to pray, and this child is really representing all of your children. Church, could you pray along with me, please, as we pray for these families? So God of heaven... Uh, we come before you recognizing your great gift in these kids. God, there is, there is no possession in any of our lives that even remotely comes close to what you have given to us and our children. And so, God, we lift these families up to you, these young families. God, they are trying to do it right. They are trying to honor you. And so, God, I pray that your strength would be with them, that your wisdom would be all upon them. God, that you would bless them and favor them in every single way. Favor them with health and prosperity. Help them, God, in wisdom and relationship. Help them to love their spouse well. Help them to love their kids well. Help them to lead well. God, help them to be faithful to you, God. Be their strength when they're weak. Be their hope when they, when they seem in despair. God, fill them with joy in this role, God, no matter how hard it gets at times. Help them to see that you are always near to them. In Jesus' strong name, together we say, amen. Oh, you're